Let's say it's gone. Right. Thanks. And then Abby, do I need permission from you to be able to share my screen? Uh, everyone has permission to screen share. I just set that up. So, you know, no, no. Excellent. Thank you. All this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So get started. Okay, so can everybody see my uh, title screen? Yes. Great. Okay. So, as I said, uh, um, I kind of followed the book rather than adapting uh, the uh, um, principles to our the a data set of choice. Next time, I'll figure it out. Uh, this is also my first experience with Sharingan or however you say it. So, uh, there was a lot of uh, um, last minute learning going on. So, let me see. Okay, here we go. Fortunately, I chose a, a chapter that's not that uh, challenging. It's on subsetting. And the, the four main um, parts of the chapter are selecting multiple elements, selecting a single element, subsetting and assignment. So combining subsetting with uh, uh, redefining variables or, or, or values. And then applications that can be used with these principles. Uh, selecting multiple elements, uh, we can use the square brackets to select any number of elements from a vector. Uh, for example, a vector uh, created with uh, four values, uh, which happen to end in the numbers one, two, three, four, uh, in a, a numeric vector X. And there were six uh, ways uh, described to select elements from an atomic vector. Uh, we can select by position using positive integers. So those integers referring to the position within the vector. So, and, and this is a, um, a blunder I actually made yesterday when I was trying to subset a vector and I just put X and then one comma three in brackets. You can't do that. You have to wrap it and combine or C to, to make, get that to work. Um, then you can um, return a vector with certain elements removed from it by using negative integers. Uh, so in this example, negative two, uh, you could do negative C combined two and four, for example, but what you cannot do is mix negative and positive integers uh, to subset in that way. But that's a way that you can subset when you have a large vector and you just want to remove a couple of values. Um, one of the ways that we're pretty familiar with uh, subsetting a vector is with uh, subsetting a, 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 an atomic vector is with logical vectors. So it can be a series of uh, Boolean true false uh, um, values, or it can be a, an expression, a conditional expression. And uh, what will be subsetted are the uh, elements of the vector for which that condition is true. In this example, all of the elements uh, that are greater than three, and we, we define that by x bracket x greater than three, we will pull out all the values that are greater than three. Now, uh, something that Hadley comments on is the um, uh, recycling behavior of R. If we use a set of conditions that happens to be uh, smaller than the um, vector we're subsetting, R will recycle that. So if we just use two uh, uh, Boolean values, true, false, on a vector of four, length four, um, it's going to apply those Boolean values in a looping way. Uh, and that can be dangerous. Um, I guess in this, in this chapter in particular, I noticed it in the book, but in this chapter in particular, I hear a lot of Headley's voice saying, this is how things break. And uh, it's almost like he's, he's telling us battle stories of how things can go badly, and how to be explicit about avoiding that. Um, and we'll, we'll see more examples of that later. Um, if you have NA in the index, it will return an NA value, okay? Um, a fourth way uh, to subset is with an empty index, which for an, uh, an atomic vector like this uh, doesn't seem to make much sense, but it, this actually can be useful for multidimensional objects such as matrices, arrays, and data frames. Uh, zero returns an empty vector, which is uh, mentioned uh, that can be useful in certain uh, testing situations. Um, and then finally, another way that we, we're probably familiar with is a character vector. So when we have a named vector, uh, we can uh, subs, subset um, 
using the names of uh, uh, in the vector. Um, so in this case, uh, setting the names to letters A, B, C, D, now we can subset using um, uh, the letters uh, uh, A, B, C, D. We can also do this, uh, we can reuse indices. So for example, A, A, A will return uh, a, a vector of three values all corresponding to the name A. Um, what's important here is that partial matching of strings is not allowed with the single uh, uh, squared brackets. Um, so um, there, are, there are cases that we'll see, for example, the dollar sign where partial matching is possible, and that is also something that can break things when you have uh, elements that have similar names uh, in, in a, a vector or a data frame. Also, Hadley cautions against uh, using a factor as an index because factors are actually, they lie on top of integers. And so you may think that you're using a factor, but it's converting it to an ind integer and you may be grabbing the wrong thing. Uh, lists, uh, and we'll return to these uh, later, but there are three ways to subset lists. Single brackets will subset a list, for, a sublist from a list. Double brackets is how we extract the element from the list, the, the value uh, or the, what is contained in that sublist. And the dollar sign can also extract an element from a list. Uh, and we'll, uh, we're familiar with the dollar sign, uh, for example, in data frames, which are a, a special type of list. Um, there are three ways to subset, subset matrices and arrays using uh, multiple vectors, uh, so uh, um, multidimensional, a single vector, or a matrix. So for example, if we form a matrix uh, using the values one through nine and finding the number of rows uh, three, uh, what we'll end up with is a, a three by three matrix, and then we can assign column names uh, A, B, C. So now if we were to take this matrix and we ask for, um, we want the first two rows and, and all of these subsetting, uh, um, the two dimensional subsetting is always row comma column. So in this case, we're asking for rows one and two and we're leaving the column designation empty. Uh, that's saying return all the columns. So it will return rows one and two as indicated by the um, uh, uh, row indices here and the named columns, all named columns here. Okay. So we can subset with numbers in this way. If we were to subset, we wanted, let's say one and three, we would do rapid and combine again, C one comma three. Um, much as what we see in the next example, instead of using numbers, indices, we're using Boolean values. So we're setting um, row, uh, the rows uh, to true, false, true. So we want rows one and three, and then we want columns B followed by A. So this is a way that we can um, uh, reorder the columns. And you'll notice that in this case, what is being returned are rows one and three, but they're being identified now as row one and two, because when the matrix, matrix is returned, it does not preserve the original row indices, it re, re, reassigns them. Um, notice that if we select zero rows and also use the minus two to take out the second column, this returns an empty matrix. Um, however, it still has dimensions. Okay, so if we, if we take this and then wrap it in dim, what we see is that it has zero rows and two columns. Um, however, if we just use a single uh, row uh, in all the columns and then check out the dimensions there, uh, what we get is a null, uh, uh, null set of dimensions. So what we're returning is a, uh, in effect, not uh, uh, a matrix, it's, uh, I believe it's, a, it's an atomic vector from the matrix because we're selecting a single um, row. Um, that's my understanding of it. Um, and it's also useful to remember that, uh, and this is something that I, I was not very uh, um, sharp on, matrices and arrays are reconfigured vectors. So what you're doing is you're taking a series of values, either numbers or characters or integers, and you're assigning them to a two by two um, structure, but underlying that, it's simply a vector that's, that's being, it's populating rows and columns. So what we can actually do is if we create a vector like this, which appears to be a five by five 
matrix. I mean, that's, that's what it is. We can actually look for value number four here. We don't, we don't have to be explicit about row column. We can actually say, give me value four, and it'll go count down the column, one, two, three, four, and return this value. And then number 15, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and return this value. And so it's a way that we can linearize. Matrices are linear underneath, okay? Um, now we get to data frames and tables. And last week, um, well, the, the presentation was about, in some ways, about how data frames and, and tibbles are distinct from each other. Um, and uh, it's useful to emphasize some of the differences uh, uh, between data frames and tibbles as well. So uh, data frames can behave like both matrices and lists. If we put in a single index that is without a comma, um, we can uh, extract columns, we'll extract complete columns. Uh, in this case, and these, in the MT cars data set happens to be named. So we're getting the uh, with row names. So we get the row names and then we get column one and column two. We can also uh, do that in a more explicit way. And I tend to prefer whenever I'm doing either like select in the tidyverse or uh, doing the base art uh, way of subsetting. I prefer to use names rather than positions. First of all, names tell me what I'm gonna get. And second, names don't change when the order of the columns change. Um, but anyway, anyway, you can see that both of these uh, methods will return uh, the first two columns along with the row names of the MT cars um, data set. I've truncated both for read readability, but it returns every value in those rows, in those columns, excuse me. Now, if we decide to use the row, comma, column syntax, this is how we can extract a two-dimensional object, which has a specified number of rows and columns. In this case, I'm asking, take the first two rows and the first four columns. Again, if you've been using tidyverse, you're probably using something like select and filter uh, or something similar to that, but this is the base R way of doing it. Now, with um, a data frame, you can uh, uh, lose dimensionality. I'll, see, I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, but the advantage of a tibble is that if you subset with brackets, you always get it. So I'll talk about this preserving dimensionality. And this is uh, another uh, kind of war story that uh, Hadley describes of how things can break, which is you think you've got a, da a data frame and you say, okay, well, when this is subsetted, it'll return to data frame and everything's great. And then somebody tries to subset it with just one column. And what is returned is not a data frame. What's returned is a vector um, and so, or a single dimension object. And then the downstream code breaks because you no longer have a data frame. And this is a, a default uh, behavior of base R that you can avoid by either including the drop equals false argument in your subset parameter. So make sure you explicitly say drop equals false or use tables which do not drop dimensions. And as I mentioned on the previous uh, slide, uh, anytime you're bracketing the subsetting with tibbles, you get a tibble back. And that's one of the, the reasons I believe that the tibble package was created. It's kind of like the strings as factors equals false argument that was, had been such a headache when it came to uh, reading in data frames. Okay. Um, so now we get to oh, uh, selecting a single element, which is uh, particularly important in lists uh, because of the different behavior of uh, single brackets, double brackets, and dollar signs. Um, so a, s a single bracket will extract a list, a sublist. it always returns a list, we want the contents of that list or, content or one of the elements of that list, we then have to use the double brackets. Okay. Um, and uh, 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 double brackets or dollar sign. Uh, with the double brackets, it, we have to use a single value um, to try to combine one and two. So we want uh, element one and element two. Instead, it's going to pull out a single value using one and then two. Um, and uh, this is another thing that Hadley brings up in, uh, in the chapter, which 
is, is kind of interesting, and I'm, I haven't adopted it, but I think it's interesting, that when we're subsetting an atomic vector, and I'll, I'm sorry about the dogs here, but uh, when you're subsetting a, an atomic vector, uh, so that is just a, uh, let's say, vector one to 10, he prefers to explicitly use double brackets. Even though single brackets work just fine, he prefers to use double brackets because it's clear in the code that you're pulling out a single value. Um, and it's interesting. I, it's something I'm, I'm going to consider uh, using because, yes, the single bracket works just fine. But again, I think he's, he's talking from experience of being very clear and explicit about what your code is supposed to do, not only to other people really reading your code, but to you in the future, six months from now, trying to figure out what the hell your code is supposed to be doing. Okay, and then we go to dollar sign. Dollar sign, um, he says, I say equivalent, but the, the term he uses is roughly equivalent to double brackets. Um, now, the, do, the dollar sign, one, of the, one difference is that it does not work with stored variables. That is, if you were to assign the um, uh, character uh, string CYL to a variable and then try to subset using the dollar sign and that variable, it does not work. It does work with double brackets. So that's one thing you have to be careful about is that dollar sign only works when, the, uh, um, uh, when you are actually naming the specific elements in the list or in the data frame. And then also dollar sign allows partial matching. So let's say you have one column that is A and another column that is ABC and you ask it to re return A it could return A or it could return ABC. Uh, and so that is, again, uh, something to avoid. You can set global op options to avoid that. Or again, Hadley's suggestion, use tibbles because they do not allow partial matching. Okay. Um, missing and out of bound indices. Uh, there's inconsistency in how, how our handles uh, either missing values or values that are out of bounds. And there's a, a table in the chapter, uh, which I did not reproduce here, but it explains the different ways in which that is handled by uh, base R. And this is where Hadley recommends the per package and uh, the use of pluck or chuck. Uh, pluck will ex explicitly return an NA, or, or a null, I'm sorry, and you can change the argument to, to, to NA. And then chuck will return an error. But both of them will uh, give you an explicit um, return value to tell you that your index is out of bounds or that your value is missing. Um, two other um, operators that are mentioned, they're just brought up briefly, they're not really discussed, uh, but they'll be revisited in chapter 15 because they're used for S4 objects, are the at sign, which is the dollar sign, but applied to S4 objects, and then slot function, which is a double bracket, again, applied to S4 objects. Okay, so now we get to 4.4, subsetting an assignment. Now, and th what this involves is you can subset and reassign at the same time. And this can be useful, for example, if we have a vector where we want to edit a value. Uh, we have the vector X, which has three names, one of which is misspelled, so what we can do is simply subset and assign at the same time and that way we convert one of the values the subsetted value in the vector um, so and, and another caution uh, the length of the subset um, uh, uh, the length of the subset and length of the assignment vector should be the same because again R will recycle the length which can lead to unwanted behavior in, in some cases so either using, using a, a length one or a length that is constant between the two. Um, what you can do if you want to is, for example, if you have a list and you want to empty out one of the elements of that list, you can use null. So here uh, with the double brackets, uh, use, uh, selecting B, uh, the, the, the sub element B from X and assigning null, you can then uh, empty out one element of that list. Um, 
now, one of the um, uh, uh, benefits that Hadley mentions uh, from subsetting with nothing, if we subset with nothing and then apply an operation to that, we can maintain the structure of the object. So in this case, uh, you can see the two different uh, results that come out from between um, empty cars with the brackets and empty cars as uh, uh, an object without brackets. By applying the brackets, what we're saying is we want to apply this operation to the empty cars um, uh, uh, data frame, but we don't want to change the underlying character of it. Uh, and so when we're applying the as integer using L apply, uh, we can use the uh, empty brackets to avoid conversion of the type. So finally, uh, the last part of this, um, of this chapter has to do with various applications we can use. Um, uh, one is to create lookup tables. Uh, anyone who's, who's worked with uh, Excel might have done this, but basically you're looking up, uh, um, based on um, uh, values in one uh, column, you're looking up in another table uh, um, possible assignments. And, and the example given here is, uh, we have a vector with a uh, single letter values, M, F, and U, and then we want to assign um, uh, full name values uh, based on a, a vector called lookup. So when we use lookup and then subset for X, what we get is the, um, uh, um, the values in X and then the assignment of the values that are in lookup. And if we want to, um, uh, if we want to then remove the names, uh, we can wrap lookup x in unname, the function unname, and then what we'll get is a, back is a vector of those values, male, female, and na. Uh, so it's just a way to uh, convert one set of values into another set of values based on a lookup function. Um, we can also do things uh, like, uh, for example, uh, it's, 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 it's a um, kind of a more advanced way of uh, using lookup where, uh, uh, for example, let's say we have uh, grades uh, D, A, C, B, F in a vector. And then we have a data frame that actually contains info about what those grades represent. Uh, what is a, uh, a qualitative evaluation and whether or not the student will fail. And then what we can do is uh, by assigning a, um, using the function match, uh, and match, we'll match the grades to the information uh, uh, in the grade column. So info, a dollar sign grade, uh, it's effectively looking up and we assign this to ID. Um, and I'm sorry, the output of ID there is wrong because I, uh, because I changed the, um, the, the example. So disregard that, um, that uh, output for ID. But then what we can do is by subsetting info ID uh, what we will do is take the, um, uh, the vector of um, info and uh, by subsetting ID, we now populate a number of columns where uh, the grades in grade are now returning the um, uh, qualitative and uh, pass-fail um, results as well. So it's described as a way to uh, rather, rather elegantly combine data. Um, there are also examples given for, for example, random samples. Uh, uh, if we want to sample, we can use the sample function uh, from a data, a data frame like uh, empty cars. In this case, take three, uh, any three um, uh, values from that data set um, and, um, and, and return the, the, the answer. We can use this for random sampling. We can also use this uh, with the argument replace equals true if we want uh, sampling with replacement. Okay. We can also order. Um, and so this is a way, and again, if you're using tidyverse, you might not uh, see the, the uh, reason for this, but in BASAR, this is a way to um, resort the uh, uh, data frame like empty cars by order of, for example, um, the MPG. Uh, variable. Sorry, now it's our dogs that are starting up. Um, this is what I get for trying to get some fresh air during the presentation. Um, another nice thing that we can do is um, we can, uh, for example, let's say we have a, um, a data frame 
with names and then counts. In this case, number of times that that person has um, appeared in the data set. And we want to now expand that data frame so that that, per that person is represented the number of times in the data frame according to that n variable. So what we can do is using the rep or repeat function, we can um, expand the data frame so that each person is represented that number of times. And I, I, I like this because I've had some use cases where I actually needed to do that to me how to do it. But uh, it, it, it's, uh, and, and then of course, if you want to, you can drop the end column uh, and, and you can easily um, uh, 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 recreate it if necessary using uh, tidyverse functions like count or tally. Um, so if we want to remove columns from a data frame, uh, we can do that uh, either by in a way that does not uh, change the data frame by simply um, uh, uh, subsetting or we can also use null to completely delete the column. Now that will change, uh, doing that will change the data frame. So we no longer have the uh, other column uh, in the data frame. Uh, we of course can subset as we saw earlier uh, based on a condition. So in this, in this case, I'm subsetting the empty cars based on a condition. Give me all of the um, rows for empty cars where gear is equal to five. And of course, I have to keep the comma in there because I need to be explicit about uh, take these rows, but also take all columns. If I leave the, col the comma out, it will break, and I do this all the time. Okay, finally, um, we can use a um, Boolean algebra to uh, select, and uh, in combination with uh, a which function, uh, we can um, uh, develop a Boolean vector. I'm sorry, the dogs are just about to bark again. Um, the, uh, so one example is uh, we'll take a, a, a vector of numbers from one to 10 and then use the modulo operator with two to uh, equal to zero to find all of the numbers that are even between uh, one and 10 divisible by two. And we get a Boolean vector, false, true, false, true, et cetera. Now, if we apply the which function to that, and I don't like this example because what it's returning are not values, what it's returning are indices, okay? And this is a confusing example uh, because two happens to be indexed by two and four happens to be indexed by four. So we're not really returning values, we're returning in locations in the vector. Same when we do the same thing with uh, one to 10 divisible by five, we will return uh, index five and index 10, which happen to be the numeric five and numeric 10. And then when we apply the which, we get that, uh, um, uh, those two uh, indices. Um, and then when we, if we want to, once we've created these two vectors, x1 and, x and uh, y1, uh, what we can also do is use uh, Boolean operators. In this case, give me all of the values or the indices that is uh, between one and 10 that are both divisible by two and divisible by five. And we see that the number at index 10, uh, which happens to be number 10, uh, is the only one for which that's true. Uh, if I, I, when I saw this example, I really wanted to redo it because I don't like it. Uh, it's, it's deceptive. But this is it. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the example in the book. And given more time, I think I would clean up some of these, um, uh, these examples. Anyway, uh, that is the end of chapter four. Aside from the um, uh, um, quiz questions, which I, uh, I looked at and I, uh, uh, in some cases I answered, but if anybody wants to either um, uh, talk about those uh, quiz questions or exercises or anything else, uh, feel free. Thank you. Great job, Mike. Does anybody have any questions or comments or corrections? I, uh, I appreciated at the beginning of the chapter, Hadley mentions that um, subsetting and ind indexing in R is 
easier or like more streamlined than many other languages. And I, I felt validated by that because every time I have to switch to, to reluctantly to Python for like some thing that I can't, you know, can't do otherwise, I just get, I fall at the first hurdle basically of trying to subset whatever array <laughs> I'm dealing with because I, yeah, it just, I'm sure people coming from Python to R have the same issue, but I, I've always suspected, like the R indexing is intuitive, more intuitive to me than other, um, other languages. So I thought that was fun. <laughs> is, is, is everyone in the group experienced in other languages? I'm, I'm strictly R. I wouldn't not say really. experienced. <laughs> I use it, but I don't, I'm not good at it. <laughs> I did a fair amount of MATLAB uh, back in the day, but uh, R is definitely easier in terms of indices. Yeah, I use a little Python. Uh, I agree, it's less, I think it's less intuitive, but I started using R first, so maybe that's why. Um, but I think the thing, the thing that trips me up there is usually like that the index starts at zero and, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and that, and that the, um, that the, uh, it's not inclusive, right? Right. Right. So, like that, that also confuses me a lot. Um, so, I'm glad R doesn't do that. I, I agree with that. And when I tried to learn Python, uh, that was one of the things that really set me off. And then, of course, the, all the hardcore programming people are saying, no, of course, zero based indexing is what everything's built on. And I was saying, just because everything's built on it doesn't make, make, mean it makes sense. I, I got very frustrated by that. Yeah, if it, one thing I do like about indexing there is like, I think you can, I don't do this a lot, so I kind of forget, but I think you can like traverse the lit, like the in the array backwards if you do negatives. So like you can say like That's true. negative one in the row and I'll get the last row. Uh, so that that's kind of nice sometimes, but uh, so I don't know. So that could be confusing, I guess, with R because it'll drop whatever you're, uh, as you pointed out, but um, anyway. Yeah. Oh, and another thing, I think this chapter made me love the tidyverse more because R is uh, a lot inconsistent. Like every time they say, oh, this work like this, but it's inconsistent. Everything is inconsistent. I think we don't have to worry about like if the the vectors will be the same size, if the elements in the data frame will have the right side, because when you're doing a mutate or in select it does or in filter it does the right way. I feel like I understand the need of the tidyverse more. I, I agree. And uh, now, of course, we're cover covering a lot more things than just data frames or tibbles. But if, if I've got two dimensional data, I'm going straight to tidyverse. I know the verbs. I know the explicit variable names. I mean, it's just, it's, it's so much friendlier to me than all, you know, I think one thing that when I started learning base hour before I learned about tidyverse and learned about all these different ways to subset, and I was just like, I only need one. Okay, one that really works, that's all I need. If you just give me one, that's fine. And that's what the tidyverse offers. I will say this is making me think more carefully about what I'm actually subsetting. Um, I mean, yeah, like I agree if I have rectangular data or I'm, I'm gonna go straight to tidyverse, um, especially just for ease of like sharing it with people who are less familiar. But the the thing I was thinking of, the, the um, when the, the sort of the uh, subsetting and assignment, so changing the content of the data frame versus changing the object that that variable name refers to. So using the like empty bracket to assign. That was one of those things that struck me of like, I should probably be considering this more. Like when I'm, when I'm going through willy nilly changing um, variables and, and changing values, I should probably have like, for more advanced applications, I should probably have a better awareness of, am I overwriting an object? Am I changing the contents in that object? Um, so that I thought that was, that was interesting for sure. Well, bringing up that point of overwriting, I've had situations, and I think we all have had this, where you have a very large data frame 
and you know that there's some erroneous data in it. Maybe somebody's name is misspelled. And I have not found an efficient way, that is to say, a, a way that is not brute force, to change values of that, of that type. So if I find misspellings of an, a misspelling of a name in a, a data frame with 20,000 entries, what I'm typically doing is what was in the chapter, which is I'm finding the index of that error, and then I'm reassigning the correct value, and I'm doing that for maybe 100 different values. And I spend so much time doing that, and I have not found the best way to, um, to get, get around that problem. Um, and it, there's got to be a good way. There's got to be an efficient way. But I've asked in the, in the Slack, and people have offered some shortcuts, but it ends up being all pretty close to manual editing. Maybe just a little less code, but there's a vectorized version of string replace, which is in stringy or string I. I don't know how to say it. Um, no, with an I at the end. Is with an I? Stringy. Wait, is that different? There's, there's two different ones. Yeah. Dang, string, oh, what? Stringer, stringer is like a subset of string. Is, do you know if it's stringy or string I? I'm not. I'm not uh, sure. I say stringy, so I don't know. All right, I'm going to stick with that. Okay. Uh, I learned. Yeah, so instead of str underscore, there are stri underscore. Um, but you can pass it um, a named a named vector. So you could use you could use a data frame. Also, I think you can pass it uh, can you pass a data frame. I'm pretty sure, but you can pass it like these these find these and replace them with those. So you can you can do that in like a single pass right. rather than like, coding out all of the like. Right. And, you and, can put and, in like a CSV or something. Sure. And in, 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 that, in that instance, yes, you can re replace multiple, you know, you, it's a kind of like a lookup thing too. Um, it's, I, I guess it's just, you know, like, like, like a particular use case, but uh, um, I mean, this was an example. Uh, you, remember, you might remember early in the year, um, Tidy Tuesday, there was a, um, uh, uh, a data set to play with, which was all of the uh, dialogue from the office. Okay. And um, I, my, my son and I have been what, you know, really obsessed with the office. And I thought, this is great. I'm going to find out every time Michael said, that's what she said. Uh, and, and then I realized that there were about 10,000 lines of dialogue by Michael. And in about 100, his name was misspelled. And so it didn't come up correctly. And most people would say, eh, throw out those 100. You know, what's the big deal? And I, I, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I ended and and what I ended up doing and it was actually a, a pretty nice workaround. There's a package by David Robinson called Fuzzy Join, and what it'll do is use an algorithm to find all the strings that are kind of close to a particular string, you know, the distance in uh, in, in 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 characters or ASCII or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I was able to use that, and that actually knocked out probably eighty percent, but it did knock out a hundred percent of the errors, and. That was a silly thing. I mean, it's just, it was fun. But if you're working on something like clinical data or gene data or whatever, those, those cases are real things that fall through the cracks. And I don't, I don't know the right way to attack it besides sitting in front of the TV, looking for all the, you know, the weird cases and saying, okay, I'm going to edit that one. I'm going to edit that one. Yeah. So anyway. It's 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 kind of like a white whale for me. How do you how do you do how can you do that in an efficient way? And if you have a if you have a uh, a very specific like subset of identifiers, like you know only these ten names are going to be in there, then it's going to be kind of trivial. But if you have a a very wide range of names, I think error detection and correction is like this kind of frontier for code in general. Yeah, I think on my team we just push as much of that upstream as we can. So, you know, we try to attack it at the ETL to make sure that yeah. it doesn't even make it to us. Um, yeah, because yeah. we used to write this real long code, like drop all the test patients, drop all the, you know, there's just so much noise. Yeah. Um, but. I, I work with, well, well with the genetic data, and I don't know if you saw this, but a, uh, a couple weeks ago, um, there was a decision by uh, organization molecular biologists to change some gene names because of the Excel problem. 
<laughs> sorry, my dog is attacking. Um, the Excel problem, which is that Excel will convert uh, some strings to dates. Yeah. And so like the gene at SEP1 or MAR2 was being converted to a date and so it wasn't showing up in the literature. And there was something like 20% of all published papers that had used Excel had th these types of errors because of date assignment by Excel. Yeah, that was a wild reveal. <laughs> so the demoralizing. It, well, the workaround was just change the gene names because you can't change the scientists. <laughs> But now every time you're like, like blast searching on a gene name or something, you are now dealing with that change. Fun. Yep. Yep. That's right. Well, I don't know. Did anyone uh, have anything else uh, about this chapter or about the uh, problems or anything like that? I had one question from the problems, which was the NA repeating uh, there was one example with five NAs getting pushed back, um, and I understood that because it's repeating the value. It's it's it's. But then it says, why does NA double or return one value? And I I didn't understand that part. That part uh, why I was returning one, I wasn't sure of. Neither why it's only one. Which NA. number is that? Uh, let me find. So I got like 8 billion tabs open. I'm one of those people. Was that in the intro quiz? No. Was no. One? It's one of the, I think it's number two in the first okay. half. Yeah, 4.2.6, number okay. two. Oh, oh yeah. Lauren, oh, so NA Lauren, real, yeah. I think it's because the NA's are logical. Apparently, I are always recycles logicals, but it won't <laughs> recycle the um, the real values. No, no, it only recycles the logicals. Yes, if you see the, all all the times that uh, Hadley says that, oh, you have to be careful about re recycling. It's about logicals when they're inside the index. We don't recycle the real numbers or characters because there is a positions or or character names, but logicals really should uh, need to be the length of the object. But is NA really a logical? Yes. Yeah. The base but I, think in that, I think in that case it says, you know, X bracket NA and it goes, is one NA? I don't know. Is two NA? I don't know. And it just yeah. kind of repeats and keeps returning like shruggies. I don't know. So NA real is a version of NA that's numeric. Okay. Ah, okay. Cool. Okay. That was really helpful. I, I found it in my notes and I wrote down and I wrote down, I don't know this one. Someone else will probably. <laughs> so thank you, Jorge. <laughs> but any any real would do the same thing if it was a um, if it had decimals at the end. Yeah. Um, I had a question about uh, the last set of exercises, so 4.5.9. Um, the second question about selecting a random sample of M rows from a data frame, but the rows have to be contiguous. Um, yeah, I think maybe my brain died in the heat. Or something. I just like the 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 problem before that. I like made a good stab at, but that one I, I had thoughts about. I also like interpreting it. I wondered if that meant so. There's like a random starting row, yeah, random starting row, um, and so that's what you can generate like a random integer for that, and then a random ending row. But then the ending row would have to be greater than the starting row and then you also somehow have to have to include all that so like once you get like a vector of those indices you can subset easily but i wasn't i wasn't sure if anybody had um that came more easily to anybody else yeah I, the way i interpret that is that instead of taking uh random rows you're taking a random chunk of length m or number of rows m okay that's easier I think I was making it too random. Random start point and a random end point would be like a lot. Yeah, I think it's, it's so if you have a, a data frame of 30 and you want a slice, 
of six rows, but that's a that's a chunk. slice. <laughs> Just take a slice. Yeah, right. Take a slice. Get into Tidyverse. Slice that's right. <laughs> I, I'm with you there. <laughs> Thank you. But that that problem itself, I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't attack. I don't know. Does anybody have a solution? Well, I just tried, just because I was curious. Um, I'm going to put it in the in the chat. Uh, but if you run this guy, uh, the results were were curious to me. Um, right, I can actually just share my screen. I wasn't sure what it would do if it would like wrap around, but it just it starts building NAs, NA one, NA two. I wasn't expecting that at all. Um, so I just I grabbed thirty rows, but then I told it, told it to grab rows twenty five through forty. So there shouldn't be rows thirty one onward. So I was surprised that it because uh, this these are uh, row names and they have to be un unique. I I think. Um, so yeah, I don't know. That just surprised me. So when I was thinking about that question, I was curious what happened if at your random value, uh, the M plus that value exceeds the length of the data frame, what it would do. So I guess you'd have to account for that. Interesting. Well, it's got, it's giving you five row. It's giving you the first five rows, right? No, it's giving you more than the first five. It's giving you six of the actual rows. So it's, it's giving you 30, the head commit. Well, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. It yeah, so it's giving you 25 through 30 and mm -hmm. then a bunch of MAs, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you probably need to add an extra condition when you create that it has to be more than M off the end the, when you're mm -hmm. making your initial sample for your first value. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, Abby, for the one that you were talking about, that was more complex. You could just have it you assign a, a start value and then say, you know, find a second value that is farther than the first value. So you could just run a, like a, a loop on that. Right. If you, you could get there. I don't know why I'd ever want to do that, but, you know. Yeah, I have that thought a lot. <laughs> but, you know, I'm trying. I'm making a good faith effort. I'm trying to try to learn. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I'm thinking back, Josh, to what you said, I think the, the second week or about uh, Tibbles, uh, about how, um, like, it didn't, and I agree, that it didn't seem like there were that many, like, differences with data frames. And then I feel like with every chapter, it's like, it feels like the book is an argument for Tibbles in some ways. Like, yeah. it's like, I see it more and more kind of as you go through these different, the different ways that base R can do things. And um, I don't know, it makes more sense, I think, now. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like a lot of the issues that data frames would come up are now removed if you use Tibbles. And since I think I've hit every single one of the things that he says, I've, I've had that issue at some point. It, it does make a significant good argument. Has anyone ever used an S4 object? Like I actually had to use the at symbol before? Um, in, in, um, in molecular biology, we use a lot of S4 um, stuff. Um, it, and I have not seen the at object. There's a lot of, I, I, I recall using dollar signs, but a lot of like the packages on Bioconductor um, are built on S4. And the reason for that is um, the way I try to think of an S4 object is kind of like a file drawer uh, or, or like a file cabinet. And you need to be able to go to the drawer that you want and pull the data out of it and know that it's there. And also you need to be able to overwrite the data in one drawer without change to the rest of the object. So it's a way to um, have a data structure that won't break um, and can have empty drawers. So you have slots, 
okay? And you, you saw the verb, the function slot. You have slots in there. And one can have like, um, like uh, mapping data and one can have metadata and one can have counts and whatever. And, but you, you know which drawer everything's in. And so then when you're doing an operation, you're doing an operation on one of those drawers. Uh, but I have to admit that in a lot of those cases, what I'm doing is I'm following a tutorial, copying the code, making sure it works, and that, okay, it works. <laughs> I haven't figured out what it's doing yet, but I have not seen the at and I have not seen the slot uh, function. But um, yeah, if, if, you, if you get deep into, into um, you know, like omics, um, genomics, transcriptomics, you're probably gonna end up using S4 objects. I don't remember which tools I was using, but when I was doing a lot of stuff with maps before the SF package came along, you'd have to use the at sign to get into the, um, like the, the DBF that's associated with the shape file. So to get into the column names, you'd have to, to deal with that. It was kind of confusing. I think I had the same experience once where it was one package, one output. Had, I had to use ats and I did not know why at the time. And I was like, oh, it's a different type of object. And that was the only use I ever had. Yeah, I'm realizing I've used a lot of S4 objects um, and similarly the phylogenetics packages. Um, that's the, the, file, the file drawer uh, metaphor was actually really helpful. I also have never, yeah, never really paid attention to like what the kind of object is because it's always like, I just need this to work, please just work. Um, I've never used at before either. Um, One of the scary things about S4 objects if you, you know, for somebody who's not familiar with them is that you overwrite the object to fill one of the drawers. And that is like, what the fuck am I doing? I'm, I'm just going to erase all my data. But what you're doing is you're putting it into a drawer, in an assigned drawer. And it says, you know, so go ahead, do this. And I'm like, no, you don't do that. You don't overwrite. But it's a totally different thinking. It's, 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 you are, you're, you're putting it where it belongs in, in, in your object. And, you, and, and the structures are really complex. They're basically lists. They're huge, huge, huge lists. So if you look at the, um, you, you build an object, like let's say uh, um, an RNA-seq. So you're doing, you're doing transcriptomic data. You're looking at uh, RNA reads of genes. And you make an RNA-seq object. And then you look at that object. It's basically like an office building. It's huge. And, but then you can see, oh, here's where I have my metadata. And here's where, where the counts are and things like that. And the thing about R is you have a lot of people who want to do this kind of work who are not programmers. And so Bioconductor and all those packages are kind of ways where they say, don't worry, we'll hold your hand, you put everything where it belongs, it won't break, and people can get workflows going. And so it's kind of that R philosophy of you don't need to, to you know, uh, build your own computer from scratch in order to code. You can get work done. Abby, are you still recording this? Uh, I wasn't recording it. I think Kevin was recording it. Okay. Yeah, I'm recording. Yeah. Okay. Should be okay. Well, Abby, thank you very much for uh, hosting. This. Yeah, thank you for presenting. This is great. Does somebody is is somebody uh, assigned for next week? Yeah, we do. Um, uh, it is sorry. It is uh, Minoski. Um, so I don't know if she's put it on GitHub yet, but she uh, messaged me. Uh, last week. Um, let me just double check. I think she was here earlier tonight, but I don't see her right now. Um, yeah, she put her name in the week six, so, uh, or week, oh, she's in week six, actually, so we don't have anyone for week five for control flow. Um, does anyone want to go? Uh, if not, I can do it as well. I'm down to go. Okay. Cool. Is that Eric? Uh, yeah, this is Eric. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so, um, I guess you, 
just add your name to the GitHub uh, readme um, when you get a chance. Uh, but that sounds good. I guess we will have you next week, and then Manaski in week six, the chapter six. Um, cool. All right. Uh, that sounds good. I I mean trying to push some of the updates to GitHub, but I've been like making a lot of mistakes along the way. And so I have all these readme conflicts. Uh, so I haven't, um, some of the videos links aren't updated right now, but uh, that should be done soon. I think I've figured out what I was doing, doing wrong. Um, all right, uh, does anyone else have anything before we stop? My mind just gets blown by you. you pass in a longer index to subset a smaller table and you expand it. That's blowing my mind, I don't know why. Do you, do you mean where you were able to repopulate, add a number of rows based on? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, repeat. Yeah, that one was, that one took some going through for me. I didn't, didn't grasp that off the start. <laughs> Maybe still don't. Yeah, that's something I kind of want to uh, want to tag because I know it's going to come up for me again, and I'm going to look on Stack Overflow or something and get frustrated. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it seems like it it can be very useful. Yeah, it seems like. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, okay. You can imagine like you like you're giving instructions. Like I want this. I want one. I want two. I want three. You're not like changing. You're like you're saying, I want you're saying what you want you want to get. The thing is, like you're not like you're not saying that you have it. We have your data frame, and you want one, want two. You are making a copy of it, and you're making a cop the copy bigger. The same. I think it's more like how we think about it. We're always thinking like that. Oh, you're subsetting. We're subsetting. We're working this data frame, but though we're like working on a copy, and the copy could be bigger. Yeah, that helps. So you're selecting from the smaller set to expand it out. Yeah, just as a little uh, counterintuitive. Like I'll, I'll get it. Like that makes sense when you said it. Then I'll probably get confused again looking at it. But yeah, that made uh, it's it's pretty powerful. I think there's a tidyverse way to do that too, isn't there? I can't remember. You can, pass a, you can pass a, a vector into slice. So when you say slice and you can ask for more, if you repeat the, the, the indices, it should bring that row back multiple times. And then you can also do a nice thing. If you have two tables that have um, mostly the same column names, but not in the same order, you can use one of and say, find like select from this table one of the names of that table and it will like select them in the right order it's like a, it's like a nice one so, so that's o n e o f o o f yeah one of yeah uh -huh. yeah one of okay and you can do like minus one of two to say like none of those like not okay. one of yeah it's it's helpful yeah this is cool stuff yeah, I looked up uh, string stringy by the way, if that's how you pronounce oh, yeah. it. And uh, they, it's it's interesting. They're very, it seems very opinionated. They're like, is the, the R R package? I saw that. <laughs> and Did it's they like how to pronounce it. Yeah, stringy. Uh, okay. the, like they have a Y at the end as like a, the way to pronounce it. Yeah. Um, but uh, the uh, it also says, which I didn't know, that uh, string R is based on stringy. Yeah, it's like yeah, a I, subset. I, I, yeah, I, didn't, I didn't realize too. that. I've never heard. I before you mentioned, I never heard of it, but uh, I will check it out. Awesome. I, I get the feeling that in the R community, the, uh, pack, the creators of the packages that um, are not part of part of the tidyverse have some resentment toward those that are part of the tidyverse, feeling like they've been kind of left behind. The guy who made data table, I know, had kind of a public. Um, I wouldn't say spat, but he, I think he felt like I made this really cool package that has, you know, great applicability, but everybody went to the tidyverse. And I, I, th I seem to recall that he and Hadley kind of had a public, uh, um, what, um, 
resolution where Hadley said, let me make a, um, a cheat sheet for a data table and let me incorporate more of it in, you know, as, as uh, alternatives to tidyverse. So. Yeah, I think the guy's name is Matt Doyle. He even looks mean. Like I've seen his picture. <laughs> He's an intimidating guy. But apparently his package is uh, pretty good, man. I, I haven't learned the API at all. I just use uh, DeepLayer. Yeah, I, I mean, he, he had a course up on um, uh, Data Camp when I was still subscribed, and I kept seeing it thinking I should take that. And then when I punted on Data Camp, it was, you know, one of those, those packages I never learned. I can see that being really frustrating to, to sort of have your package get overlooked. But on the other hand, I think Tidyverse is popular for a reason, and I think a lot of it has to do with the effort that has been put into accessibility right like the fact that there are even those cheat sheets and like the way that it's explained is like infinitely approachable and so if you want people to use your package you gotta have that at this point i think um, and, and it, it's it's really an advantage to have an integrated ecosystem so that you can pipe straight from dplyr r into gg you know and it's just or you can even put deploy our functions in ggplot and everybody plays well it's you know it's totally revolutionized the teaching too like it's it's when i need to teach an undergrad r it's it's so easy to just be like here it is like it's not mm -hmm. when i was an undergrad everybody was like r is so hard it's so scary only the grad students use it you'll never get good at it and like mm -hmm. you know parts of it were hard if i tried to learn some of this stuff off the bat i, I still have no clue um Anyway, that's not a topic for, for here anymore. <laughs> right, not to monopolize people. I'm thinking about teaching a lot. I've, I ended up with like a really insane teaching load. So, um, is, is it all undergrads? Yes. And is it, is it like a, um, um, is it like seminar level? I mean, are you doing interaction? No, no. It's a, it's a 350 person intro biology class. Oh my God. So, and all I want to do, I want to like get them programming since we're all going to be remote anyway. I'm trying to think of activities where it would be, yeah, like what the hell? You're already sitting in front of your computer. Let's, let's bust into R a little bit and, uh, and do something. And then you don't have to feel like a total idiot for not knowing how to program in three yeah. years. Yeah. <laughs> so. Excited for control flow next week. Bet. I'm going to sign off. I'm going to see you next week. I'll have my beer cold next week. Cheers to you all. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, thanks again, Mike. Uh, awesome. Yeah, thanks, Mike. My pleasure. Uh, next time I'll do a better job, I swear. It was great. <laughs> it was great. Yeah. All right. See you all later. Bye. Bye, guys.